Then the second half he spends on practical application. This is what you do with the theology. This is what you do with, with the doctrine. And he does that here as well as in other books. Uh, uh, Romans is probably a great example. The first uh, eight chapters or so are, are heavy doctrine. The, the last eight chapters or so are, are practical. He does that here too, but chapters one through three are written as a prayer, as a song. It's a, there's, a beauty, there's a beauty to the language. It's not just a doctrinal discourse. The language is lofty, it's beautiful, and as we will be unpacking passage by passage, but you'll see this. Now, in this book, Paul is not addressing any particular issues or sin. Now, like we've gone through Galatians. A couple years ago, we, we taught through Galatians, and the Galatians were actually, uh, they were believing a false gospel. And so Paul starts out, I can't believe you guys are, are, are buying into this false gospel. And so that, that was the issue that he was writing about. That was, that, was that, 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 that core that the rest of the book was written around. We think of uh, Corinthians who were just prideful and living in sin, and, and he has to address these issues. Even Thessalonians, the first Thessalonians we taught through just recently, uh, some of the believers were dying, and the people wrote Paul a letter and said, hey, what happens to believers who die before Jesus comes back? And so he wrote regarding that. This doesn't have any of those particular issues or sins. This, a, this is a general book that's, that's being written. Now, Paul is going to mention love early and often. He's going to, I think, uh, uh, a sick, Paul wrote 13 books of the New Testament, and about a sixth of all his mentions of godly love are in this book. Now, in light of what John wrote in Revelation chapter 2, that the city of the, the church of Ephesus lost their first love, repent and do the works you did at first, uh, in light of that, this seems to be a bit of a warning how important love is, godly love is in the Christian life. So this morning, we're just going to dip our toes into the book. This is the introductory message. We're not going to dive headlong into it. We would drown. So we're going to just dip our toes, get a start here. We're going to examine the author. We'll examine the date and the city. And we'll talk about some of the, some of the uh, uh, doctrinal significance of those things. And then we'll end by looking at the theme of the book. What, what is the theme of this letter? In the process, we'll learn some important lessons about the God who inspired this passage. So let's jump right in, and we'll just, we'll just get right to it. Uh, the author of the book is Paul, the Apostle Paul. Uh, verse 1, first word, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. So it starts out with, with him naming himself. Actually, in chapter 3, he also refers to himself. So a couple times in this, this letter... Paul is referred to as the author. Paul wrote 13 of the 26 New Testament books. 14, if you count Hebrews, there's some debate whether he wrote Hebrews or not. And as you, when you think about this, a person who wrote literally half of the New Testament, if you didn't know better, you would assume that he was raised a Christ follower, that he was in diapers and trusted Jesus and grew up uh, serving Jesus and trusting Jesus. That's what you would think if you didn't know better, that he was dedicated to Jesus from an early age. But if you do know better, if you know, if you've read the book of Acts, you'll know that that's not the case. Paul was the former persecutor of the church. Saul of Tarsus, that was his name, that's his Hebrew name. So some of the debate, uh, Paul is a Greek form of his name, Saul is the Hebrew form, so Saul of Tarsus was his name. He was a pure-blooded Benjamite. And that was, that's a big deal. He mentions this in, in, uh, in some of his other writings, that, that he's, you know, he's a Benjamite, an Israelite of the Israelites. And what he, what he means by that is, at this point in the first century, most Israelites did not know their lineage. They could not trace their family line back to a tribe. They couldn't trace their family, their, their family line back. There had been so many captivities. There had been so many problems. And so he was one of the precious few, prideful few, who could trace his lineage back to Benjamin. And by Benjamin, then 
to Jacob and then to Isaac and then to Abraham. He was a pure-blooded Benjamite. He was also a Roman citizen, which was even, even more rare, a Jew who was a Roman citizen. And as you read through his letters and read through the book of Acts, you'll see that on occasion he takes advantage of this citizenship. There's a point where he's, he's arrested, he's beaten, and he just points out, as, and it it's, it's, it's almost makes you laugh, almost. As he's being beaten, he basically says to the guy who's beating him, uh, are you allowed to do this to a Roman citizen? Huh, that's interesting. And the guy's, you know, guy almost, you know, his heart almost stops. What? Because no, you don't do that to a Roman citizen. And when the, the government, of the, the, the city realizes that they've, they've abused a Roman citizen, they come and they, hey, you need to just go, just go. We'll just, we'll just let you go in the night, in the middle of the night. And he goes, oh no, 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 you, you arrested me publicly. You flogged me publicly. You're going to release me publicly. We're not going to, so he took advantage of his, his citizenship. It's very interesting. He was a student of the famous Rabbi Gamaliel, who was well known in Jerusalem. Saul was on the fast track to being one of the most influential Pharisees in Jerusalem. He was a, he was a rising superstar. And not only did he reject Jesus as Messiah, and he's probably about the same age, maybe a little bit younger than what Jesus would have been. Uh, some of the commentators said that Paul was probably born around five AD. So a little bit younger than Jesus, but a contemporary. So he's in Jerusalem and he's in this area when Jesus is, is ministering and when Jesus is crucified and buried and rises from the dead. But not only does he reject Jesus as Messiah, he actively and violently attacked Christ followers. So it's not enough that he says, I don't think Jesus is the Messiah. He wants to go and physically attack those who think Christ is, Jesus is the Messiah. Acts 8.3 says this, Saul was ravaging the church, entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. So he's kicking down doors and he's dragging, dragging Jewish people out of their homes and, and having them taken to prison. Now their prison system would be very different than ours. Uh, many of these people, would, the, the goal would be to execute them for, for heresy or blasphemy or something like that. Um, but he's, he's violently opposed to Christ. He's violently approach, uh, opposed to Christ's followers. He was actually on his way to Damascus to find and arrest other Christians when Jesus interrupted him, when Jesus intervened in his life, when Jesus upended his plans. Paul is saved, he's converted, he's changed. In my notes, I have all these words together because there's all, it's, all, it's all together there. Acts chapter 9, he gets saved, he's, he's, he's different, he's converted. His deep knowledge of the scriptures allow him to immediately begin showing that Jesus was the Christ. It's fascinating. He's so angry about this Jesus, he wants to kill Christ followers. And as, and as soon as he's saved, as soon as the, the scales are literally removed from his eyes, now he sees that Christ is the Messiah. He's able to look back at the Old Testament. And one of our challenges, we always make this comment, that you know, one of the reasons we don't unhitch from the Old Testament is because Christ is taught there. Even as New Testament Gentile believers, the Old Testament's valuable. And Paul is able now, as, as, his, as his, his sight, you know, this new sight in Christ, he's able to see Christ in the Old Testament. He's able to show that Christ is the Messiah. To the point that the people who had been encouraging him to go kill Christians, they're now trying to kill him. Almost immediately, there are attacks on his life. It takes some time to convince the other disciples, even the apostles, that he was really a Christ follower. He's, he's, uh, he's saved, he's been preaching Christ, and he comes to Jerusalem and he wants to meet with the other disciples. And they're like, oh no, I, 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 no, no, maybe not. <laughs> I don't know about you. Even the apostles had to be convinced. And I think there's some wisdom in that. Uh, sometimes that Christians are accused of being just naive and being gullible. Uh, I mean, how many, how many Christ followers buy Osteen's books? You know, how many, how many Christ followers, you know, 
fall into Joyce Meyer's teachings because we're gullible. They say they're Christians, they must be. Oh no, they, you know, the, you know, the, the serpent in the Garden of Eden promised that that apple wouldn't do any, any harm. This is a good thing. Probably wasn't an apple, but you get the point. So the, the apostles, disciples, it takes some convincing. But they, finally they see the evidence. They see that he's a believer now. He's been changed. That's who this author is. He goes from being the persecutor of the church. Now he's the great missionary and church planter. Paul's conversion didn't lead to apathy or laziness. We talk about this often. Sometimes we feel like salvation is the end of the story. Oh, they got saved. Now the story's done. It's kind of like those, uh, those old princess movies where uh, they get the, the prince and the princess get married and then it says they live happily ever after the end. It's like that's the, the getting married is the end of the story and anyone who's been married, you realize that the wedding day is not the end of the story. It's the, just the beginning of a long, long, no, uh, it's, the beginning of the, <laughs> it's the beginning of the story. My wife is making faces at me now. Um, that's just the beginning Paul's salvation was not the end of the story. It's not, oh, roll credits, great, what a beautiful thing. That's the beginning. Same thing is true of us. When God worked in your heart and and miraculously saved you, and don't think that Paul's salvation was more miraculous than your salvation. If you've put your faith in Christ, Jesus saving you is just as miraculous as Jesus appearing to Paul on the road to Damascus. Because we're wicked sinners. We're, we, we're, we, we have a hatred against God. We shake our fist at God. If God has saved you, he's done it miraculously. And if he saved you, he didn't save you to sit down and just be done, roll credits. He saved you to serve him. And so Paul's conversion didn't lead to apathy, didn't lead to laziness. He spends the rest of his life proclaiming Christ. When he's rejected by his fellow Israelites, he turns to the Gentiles. He goes where Christ isn't even known. He travels preaching and planting churches throughout the Roman Empire. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, I'm the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. Uh, that's a powerful passage. If, uh, if you're looking for a life verse or some, some challenging verse, maybe you want to print up a verse and put it on the mirror that you see every day. This is a great verse for that. Paul recognized, man, I, I don't deserve to be an apostle. I am. You know, he, never, he didn't question that. He didn't question that he was an apostle. He was a sent one by God. But he understood I don't deserve it. I'm unworthy of it. He never forgot that he was a persecutor. I mean, I fought my master. I fought my Lord. I hurt his people. But in verse 10, by the grace of God, I am what I am. Paul never forgot what he was before Jesus saved him. He didn't wallow in it. He didn't let it stop him. How many times do we in our lives. Oh, I failed. I'm, I've messed up. I'm going to quit. I don't deserve to be a Christian, so I'm going to quit. It's foolish. Of course you don't deserve to be a Christian. None of us do. Paul didn't wallow in what he was. He didn't let what he was stop him. Rather, he allowed it to energize his ministry. He actively served God. He, he, un, he unfailingly served God. And part of that was because he knew what he was before God saved him. I remember, I love talking to adults who, get, who, who were saved as adults. Uh, I think it's an awesome thing to talk to children. I got saved when I was about five years old. And I love talking to children who get saved, adults who were saved as children. But there's something unique about an adult who, who remembers the old life. I, I know the old life intimately, and I know exactly what God saved me from. We had a friend up in Illinois that uh, on his, he was saved at 25, and on his 50th birthday, he gave this testimony. And basically, like, I spent half my life lost, and I've spent the other half found. And it was, it's an incredible salvation testimony. And this is Paul. He recognizes what he was, and he lets that energize his ministry because he knows intimately 
what God saved him from, how God changed him. And this is an important lesson for each of us. Remember what you were before Jesus saved you. Don't forget. Don't lie to yourself. I was a pretty good guy. Don't tell yourself that. Don't, don't, tell you, don't even let yourself think that. One of the troubles, I think, sometimes with, with people who have been saved for a long time is God's cleaned you up a lot. God, God has worked in your life. God has, God has, has maybe, maybe God has fixed your marriage and, and helped you with your children and, 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 and life is nice. And sometimes we start to think, well, you know, yeah, I was a pretty good guy. Every good thing is from Christ. Don't tell yourself you were a pretty good guy. Remember what you were before you were saved. Look deeply at what you were, but don't let it stop you. Let it energize your ministry. And I will say this, every believer has a ministry. Don't tell yourself again that, well, I'm not a pastor, I'm not a Sunday school teacher, so I don't have a ministry. You do, because ministry is service. And God's called you to serve. Maybe you serve your family, maybe you serve your community. But you have a ministry. And let that understanding of what you were energize that. If Jesus can save you, Jesus can save me. He can save anyone. So Paul is the author of this letter. The date is somewhere around A.D. 62 to 64. Different, if you have a study Bible, different study Bibles will have a few different dates. Maybe 60 to 62. But right in that range, early 60s A.D. This is during Paul's Roman imprisonment. Ephesians is called one of the prison epistles. Uh, Colossians, Philemon, and Philippians are the other uh, prison epistles. Jesus, uh, uh, Paul is, is he's jailed in Rome, and so he's writing these, these letters while he's jailed. Uh, he's under house arrest in Rome, so he's not in prison. In the, in the Philippian jail, the Philippian jail, if you, ever, if you ever study it, was literally a hole in the ground. You had the building with a, it looked like a manhole cover, and they would, they would lower prisoners down into this grimy pit. You couldn't stand up. It was about five feet high. You couldn't stand up, and, and you would sit there until your court case was called. Now, Paul spent time in the Philippian jail. But in Rome, he's under house arrest. He's rented a home, but he is bound to a Roman soldier. He had soldiers that would, would uh, come in on shifts, and they would, they would be tied to him, bound to him. But he wasn't in a... In a, a damp, dank cell. He's waiting to stand before Caesar for the grand crime of preaching Christ. And again, this was one of his privileges as a Roman citizen. As he's standing in, uh, he's been arrested. Um, the, the Jewish people who, who just hate Christ, they, uh, they're, they're attacking him. And, and Paul basically says, I appeal to Caesar, which was a Roman right. You had the right as a Roman citizen to appeal all the way up to the king. Like we might appeal a court case up to the Supreme Court, they could appeal to Caesar. And so now Paul, when Paul, once Paul appeals to Caesar, he's on a multi-year journey to get to Rome to stand before Caesar. And so, so he's in jail, he's under house arrest, better, better say it that way, and he's waiting to see Caesar to defend himself because he was preaching the gospel. And, and Paul is excited about this. He's, he's super excited about this whole deal because what does he want to do? What's Paul's purpose for living? To preach the gospel. Who's the best person to preach the gospel to? I'm going to preach the gospel to the king. I'm going to find the most powerful man in the country and I'm going to share the gospel with him. And so Paul's just waiting to see Caesar, to share the gospel with him. Sometimes I laugh at, at this whole story time period because these Roman guards, they're bound to him. He's, he's the captive, right? He's under house arrest. He's captive bound to the Roman guards. But these guards are a captive audience to him. They're a captive audience to the gospel. As he's, he's having visitors come in, he's talking about Christ and he's sharing the gospel. He's probably sharing the gospel with them. You know, when there's no visitors, he's like, hey, Hey, Brutus, or whatever the name would be, you know, hey, you want to know about the gospel? Oh, too bad, you're going to learn about the gospel, because you can't go anywhere. Uh, They're captive audiences to the gospel. One thing I think is fascinating, though, 
And, and I never really thought about this until I was uh, studying for this message. Paul didn't physically write his letters. He would speak them and he had a, what was called an amanuensis or a, a secretary who would write them down, like a professional scribe who would write down. So, so Paul would usually dictate the letters. They would be written down by somebody. And then at the very end, he would usually sign it. That's why some of, the God, some of his letters say, I, Paul, write with my own hand. He's actually talking about the signature at the bottom. So he's speaking these letters. The first time some of these letters were spoken, there was probably a pagan Roman guard hearing it. You think about the audience of Ephesians, the audience of Philippians, the audience of Colossians, where where these were written to these churches. But the first people hearing it, probably these pagan Roman guards. Just is incredible. So that's the situation. That's where he's at. He's under house arrest. This is about 30 years after his salvation. So Paul had been a believer for decades. He got saved shortly after the resurrection. So 32, 33, 34 AD. And now it's 60, 64 AD. He's been a believer for 30 years or so. He's traveled, he's preached. He saw people come to faith. He he saw churches founded, which is awesome, incredible. I mean, could I live like that? Could I I see that? As as a believer, could I see people come to faith? Could I see churches founded? Awesome. But he also took a lot of beatings. He was left for dead at least once. He was shipwrecked. He was rejected by the people he most wanted to reach. He actually writes this. He says, I mean, I, I, would, I would give up my own salvation if the Jewish people, if the Israelites, my, my brothers according to the flesh would trust Christ, would actually see him as their Messiah. I would, I would gladly go to hell in their place. That's powerful. And I cannot help but wonder how I would react if I faced the opposition that Paul did. Certainly we, want the, we would love the glorious days of thousands of people coming to Christ, churches founded. But what happens if after you've been serving Christ for 30 years, you're still getting beaten, you're still getting rejected, you're still getting shipwrecked? In our culture, we often talk about the prosperity gospel. Those guys on TV who tell you that God wants you to have a $1,000 suit and a $100,000 car. The prosperity gospel is overtly wicked in teaching that Jesus wants you to be wealthy and comfortable. That's not what the Bible teaches. And we know that. We should recognize that. If your pastor is wearing a Rolex, there's a There's a problem. There's an old Ray Stevens song. Some of you guys are old enough to remember Ray Stevens. He's a the country singer, always made, you know, made parody songs. He has one song, Would Jesus Wear a Rolex? And I, there's more theology in that song than, than I think he understands. But we get that the prosperity gospel, overtly wicked. But how many of us subtly sort of believe it? How many of us would throw our hands up and be indignant if if God allowed any of Paul's difficulties into our lives. If Paul allowed you as a believer for 30 years to be beaten, to be stoned, to be rejected. We have this sense of of, of, uh, uh, there should be a progress, certainly early on. uh, My wife and I, when we first got married, we were Christian school teachers. And uh, I, the, the school we taught at, they paid us as much as they could, but it wasn't very much. And so we really, you know, budgeting, and there was no extra spending. There were, there were, you know, tight, tight times. And then we had the brilliant idea. We're geniuses. We had this brilliant idea. Uh, these two poor Christian school teachers, you know what we should do? We should start having babies. And then my wife could stay home and stop being a Christian school teacher. So now we're going to support this on half of what that was being paid. And we had some very challenging times. We look back on that. And, but 
you know, as we grew, we, we end up becoming, I, we went to different jobs, different things, and financially we got better off, our situation got better off, and you just kind of think, well, that's the way it's supposed to be. You're supposed to be poor when you're little, young, and then it gets better, and by the time you retire, you should be comfortable. What happens if God says, yeah, I have a different plan for you? I have a plan that you're never going to be comfortable, because that's going to help you minister better. What if? I think a lot of us, I think maybe myself, we'd throw our hands up. God, you're letting me down. But that's what Paul faced. Paul served Christ because Paul saw the bigger picture. Paul's not angry. He's not indignant. He's sitting there in a, in a house he has to pay for, chained to a Roman guard only because he's preaching Christ. If Paul ever said at any point, you know what, this Jesus business, this is dumb. I'm done. I'm sorry, guys. You know, he goes to the Sanhedrin and says, guys, I'm sorry. Can I, can I, everything would have changed. Everything would have been different. Yet he doesn't do that because Paul sees the bigger picture. This life is fleeting Comfort and popularity don't account for anything of lasting value. Comfort comes and goes, right? You go to a restaurant and the meal's not quite cooked right, and, you know, comfort, you're not comfortable for a while. Popularity, you say the wrong thing. You see people on, uh, on the TV shows, uh, especially in the political realms, how many, uh, or in, even in church realms, uh, you say the wrong thing. Who was, the, who was the pastor recently? He was, uh, somebody asked him if, he, if a, a grandmother reached out to him and, and uh, he had a radio show. And she asked if she should go to her, her, her grandson's gay wedding. And the pastor, I think, Be was it Beg? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and his comment, and I, and I would tend to disagree with his answer, but I understand where he's coming from. And he said, well, yeah, go, go to the wedding and, and, and bring a gift. Show your, show your grandson that you love him. And I listened to, to what he said, and I, I you know, th there's, there's areas of disagreement there, but I understand the heart behind it. Like, you want to keep a relationship with your grandson. Oh, man, that guy, he got canceled immediately. He didn't get canceled by those crazy leftists, right, the liberals. He got, he got canceled by conservative Christians. He got, he got canceled by people that we would probably have an affinity with. You know, his, his speaking tours got canceled, Right? popularity can, can go away fast. A bad sermon, a, a poorly worded speech, gone. And Paul understood that. Comfort, popularity, or nothing. See the big picture. He serves Christ. The city that, uh, that this is written to was Ephesus. He says, uh, to the saints who are in Ephesus, and are faithful in Christ Jesus. Now, so the city of Ephesus, and we've talked about Ephesus before. I think we go to the next slide. There's a, there's a map here. This is very similar. When we went through the seven churches of Revelation, those, those red dots are the seven churches. You see Ephesus in the box, and then you have the other six churches in this, in this region. This is in modern-day Turkey, so just north of the Red Sea, east of Greece. It's right there. Ephesus was the capital city of the Roman province of Asia. So when we think of Asia, we think of China and Japan. Well, the, the, the Romans referred to Turkey, or what, what is now Turkey, as Asia. Uh, it's modern-day Turkey. It was wealthy. It was influential. It was an important city. Uh, all those other cities were connected to it. There was a mail route, and so all those other cities were connected to it. It was the home of to the monumental temple of Artemis. Sometimes she's referred to as Diana, but it was an ancient false god. Uh, it was actually, the, the Romans had a goddess Artemis, but this temple was for a different Artemis that predates the Romans. The temple was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It was 500 year, years old in Paul's time. So the Roman Empire was not 500 years old. This was an ancient, ancient temple and pagan, pagan place of worship. It was probably the size of a football stadium. 
It was, it was 430 feet long, 220 feet wide. It had 60 foot high uh, pillars that held up the roof. It was a massive place. A lot of times they wonder how they even built this thing. It was so incredibly huge. An American football field would have fit in the footprint comfortably inside with walls going around. I mean, it was probably the size of a small football stadium. So what we see in, in Ephesus is pagan religion was rooted deeply in this city. Uh, Paul's coming to this city and he's preaching Christ and Christ crucified to a city of pagans who are deeply connected to their paganism. Paul had spent two years teaching there. He began preaching to Jews. He'd go to the synagogues. He'd preach to the Jews. And then uh, any Gentiles that were in the synagogues. Because there was always a few Gentiles that they recognized the God of the Jews as the real God. They were referred to as God-fearing Gentiles. So he'd begin preaching to Jews. He'd expand to the Gentiles. Not only did he start a church in Ephesus, but Acts 19 says that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. So those, those seven cities where there were churches at, we talk about in Revelation, they probably were planted from the gospel presence in Ephesus. The, everyone in, this, in this, this province was hearing the gospel. Paul was, was busy. And the, the Christ followers, the, the people who came to Christ, were busy sharing the gospel. Paul purposely went where the gospel had not been heard. Paul introduced people to Jesus. And I think that's an interesting thing, you know, because because when you when you preached in Jerusalem, you were preaching to Jews who knew they were waiting for their Messiah. And so you were you were telling people, "Hey, this Jesus is the Messiah." But when you get out into the uh, the the far-flung regions of the Roman Empire, they don't have any idea what a Messiah is. They're not looking for a Messiah. You're completely introducing Jesus to these pagans. That's what Paul was doing. Now, it's interesting because we are starting to get that opportunity today. Uh, we like to think of America as a Christian nation, but, you know, that's, a, that's a really a misnomer. It's not really true. Even where we live has been referred to as the Bible Belt. But the gospel is increasingly unknown here. Not just rejected. Now, some, some people reject. Like, if you sit down and you talk to somebody, some people know about Jesus, and they, I don't want any part of that. But increasingly, especially for younger people, teenagers today and young 20-somethings, you know, they don't even know who Jesus is. As far as they're concerned, it's a, just a swear word. Like, and, and even then, if you notice in our culture, Jesus' Jesus's name being used as a swear word is becoming less and less. And you might think, well, that's good, right? They're not taking Jesus' name in vain. But they're not taking Jesus' name in vain because they don't even, he doesn't even register. He doesn't, they don't, it's not, I don't even know. Like, I don't, use, I don't use German swear words because I don't know the German swear words, right? Well, more reasons than that, but, but uh, I don't use those. When I was in high school, we had a couple exchange students come in, and they, they taught everyone all the bad words in their, their home language. But I don't use those words. I don't know them. And so sometimes you have people in America today, they don't use Jesus as a swear word because they don't know what Jesus is. We're, we're getting to the point where we are going to be able to introduce people to Jesus. Not just share the gospel, but introduce. Hey, have you heard? I, I, I've had people who have driven by buildings like this and not have any idea what they are. I mentioned uh, at the, the festivals we go to, we, we have three festivals that we have a booth for. And uh, we have this 10 by 10 canopy. We have Prairie Baptist Church. We have all this uh, um, paraphernalia on the table. You know, we got Bibles and books and information and stuff. And it's interesting because one or two people will walk by and you can see that just the, the anger in their eye. They don't, they're angry that we're there. One or two. You'll have some people, maybe five or six, that are, hey, man, that's good. I'm glad you guys have a booth here, and they walk on, right? Many have their own church, but you'll have, you'll have some that, that see it, and, hey, I appreciate you guys. And then the rest, they, they, it's like they look, and it's a blank. They don't even, it doesn't even register what a church is, and because they're looking for Nicky Knacks and whatever at these festivals, and they see and just scan by, and they have no idea what they're looking at. That's 
that's the world we're, we're beginning to live in. Paul chose to actively share the gospel where it had not been heard. And we are getting that opportunity. Don't assume people know about Jesus. Be ready to introduce Jesus to the people that God brings to you. God's going to bring people into your life. I mean, you guys all, every, every one of us has somebody we know that the rest of us will not ever meet. God's brought that person into your life to hear the gospel. So this is the city, Ephesus, this, this incredibly important city, and the gospel was permeating out from it. Now Paul is writing to the saints, literally the holy ones who are faithfully following Christ. He wishes grace and peace from God upon them. Now that's a standard greeting, but it's also true. God has shown grace by saving these people. He's brought his peace into their lives. For anyone who's put their faith in Christ, there's grace. God has shown grace by, by bringing you salvation. He's brought peace to you. Remember, we are, we, our, our standard position, our starting position is at war with God. We're the fist shakers. And their war with God is over. Because they now exist as his adopted sons and daughters. The same thing is true of believers today. We, our war with God is over. We can have peace with God. It's at this point we see the theme of the letter. These last two verses, verses 3 and 4, we see the theme of this letter. God's rich blessings to believers in Christ. God's rich blessings to to believers in Christ. Verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. This is the theme. Blessed be the God, literally, bless worthy to be praised. Praised be God. God is worthy of our praise because he's done this thing, because he's blessed in this way. Verses 3 through 14 are actually one long sentence in English, or in Greek, not in English, but in Greek. I used to be an English teacher, and I had kids turn in papers where you had, <laughs> you know, page one is all one sentence, and you know, give it back to them. I think there's some punctuation you need. That's, that's, that's a little rough to read. But grammatically, in Greek, verses one, 3 through 14 are one sentence. And in that sentence, Paul talks about adoption. He talks about election, redemption, forgiveness, inheritance. He covers a lot of ground in these these nine verses or so. For our purposes today, we can, we'll see the theme of the book in just verses three and four. We're not going to try to, we're not going to try to be here until 4 4 p.m. covering every single thing. We'll hit those in, in future weeks. But verses three through four, we can see the theme. We'll leave the rest for future Sundays. In these two verses, we see God's rich blessing. The first thing we see is that God blesses generously. He said, blessed be this God who's blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. So he's blessed us. He's, 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 he's given, he's, he's gifted us in Christ. This phrase, in Christ. All of our blessings are a result of being in Christ. Understand that. If you're a believer, if you're here and you're, you're, you, you've been saved, you know Christ the Savior, all of your blessings are are that result of being in Christ. We might see some lost people who have wealth and comfort and and health. I mean, there are a lot of rich lost people. And we might make the mistake of saying, man, God's blessed them. God's blessed them with all this physical wealth. But what's that wealth doing for them? It's convincing them they don't need God. That's not a blessing. That isn't. If anything comes into your life that encourages you to not trust God, that's not a blessing. All of our blessings are a result of being in Christ because Jesus paid the penalty for our sin because he covers us with his shed blood. We can take part in his inheritance. Now, much of that is future. We look forward to what comes next. This world is referred to, this life is referred to as a vapor that's here for a moment and gone. 
We make a mistake when we think that, you know, our 60, 70, maybe 80 years, 90 years on this planet, that's all there is, and that's what we got to focus on. No, we're looking forward to what comes next. But even in this life, God blesses us in Christ. Paul says this in Romans 8. He says, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we're the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. So we're, the, the Spirit testifies that we're children of God, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. He also talks about suffering. I, and I, and I, had de- I debated leaving that part in, maybe just you know, focusing on the first half of that verse, but you know what, in our culture, it's too many too many false teachers want to you know, minimize this idea of suffering, this idea that, that look, as a Christian, you're going to face difficulty. So I leave this in, we, we point this out. But there's this promise of blessing, this, 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 this adoption into God's family, being an heir with Christ, always comes from in Christ. Every spiritual blessing. God doesn't hold anything back. We're, our God is generous. Our God is is, is extravagant with his blessings on his people. Now, again, we got to guard ourselves. Our problem as affluent Americans is that we often read into a passage like this, physical blessings. God is generous, so he's going to give me money. God is generous, so I'm going to have a Ferrari or a BMW. I'm going to have these, you know, I'm going to have these expensive things. I'm going to have the world's riches. Nowhere in the Bible does God promise that. But he gives every spiritual blessing. God, uh, Paul's not saying that God is going to give us money, health, and ease. Nor does Paul model that. You can't read the life of Paul and think that God wants to give his followers right now riches and fame and popularity. You know, no, wh- which one of the apostles models that? Did Jesus model that? No. No, that's foolishness. That, that's, that's certainly foolishness. You could actually argue that Paul's life, his physical life, got noticeably worse after he trusted Christ. Remember, Paul was on the fast track to becoming, he was going to be a famous rabbi. Uh, he was a student of Gamaliel. He was going to surpass, surpass Gamaliel. He was going to be the superstar in this, this uh, Jewish culture. That was the path he was on. And when he trusts Christ, now he's being attacked. He's being, you know, attempted murders on him on a regular basis. You could argue that his physical life got worse. But God gives joy. He gives love. He gives peace, hope, purpose, confidence. The list can go on. These are real, lasting, eternal blessings. Not fleeting baubles that wear out or are lost. And we have to understand that. We have to recognize what real is as opposed to what is fake. Having peace. How many, how many famous people in our, in our culture, you know, these celebrities that we watch on the award show and things like that, uh, how many of them have peace? How many of them have hope? They have joy? Not many. You can tell by the rampant drug use, the, the, the broken marriages, the messed up lives. You can tell that. They're seeking peace and hope and joy, but they don't have it. This is what God offers. Verses 7 and 8 of Ephesians 1. Paul says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will. So he, he redeems What an expensive thing that is. What did it cost for God to redeem us? Did he have to pay a truckload of gold to redeem us? No. No. What what is that to God? There's, you know, God created all the gold. That's nothing. Did he have to get diamonds? No. What did it cost God to redeem us? The precious blood of Christ. He lavishes his gifts. 
but also in that ver- verse 9, making known to us the mystery of his will. This world, you ever, if you ever read, and we just got done with that, that Genesis study, talking about you know, our origins, where we came from, the, the creation of the universe, the flood uh, up until Abraham. We understand where we came from. We understand what our purpose is. Uh, in philosophy classes, there are what's called the ultimate questions. What am I? Where did I come from? Where am I going? What is my purpose? There are these ultimate questions that philosophers spend their lives just combing over and trying to find answers to. You crack the book open and you know the answers in five minutes. Read Genesis, you know, read Genesis 1 through, one through 11. Just read Genesis 1 and 2, Genesis 3. Part of God's blessing is making known to us the mystery of his will. Don't, don't, don't miss that. If you've trusted in Christ, God has poured out his grace on your life generously. Live like it. Appreciate it. Be in awe of it. Don't look at the lost people around you and, oh, I wish I could have you know, that new boat that that guy has. Oh, I wish I could have that shiny new car. Oh, man. Appreciate the incredible gifts that God has given you. Show the same grace to the people around you that God showed you. If you don't know Christ, if you're here and you're not a believer, he's offering every spiritual blessing to you right now. You're not here on accident. You're not, you didn't come to this church on accident. You're here to hear the gospel. He's offering salvation. He's offering restoration right now to you. He's offering redemption and forgiveness. He's offering a home in God's kingdom. That's what God offers. So he blesses generously. Verse 4 says God blesses knowingly. So he blesses generously, he blesses knowingly. Verse 4 says, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Now Paul does not shrink back from God's sovereignty. Uh, Even in verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God. Paul recognizes, Paul didn't choose Jesus. If you read Acts chapter 9, Paul was was going to Damascus to attack Christ's followers, and Jesus chose Paul. And I, and I would challenge you to read down through that passage. There, there is no part of the classic, would you like to trust Jesus for salvation? That doesn't, doesn't exist in the, in the writing there. Jesus intervenes and saves Paul. And Paul doesn't shrink back from that. We see a God that steps in and changes a sinner. Now, we'll do a deeper dive into the doctrine of election because Paul really gets into that in the next few verses. Uh, we'll probably plan on doing that next week, if the Lord wills, if we, if we can. But for de- today, it's enough to see that, that God knew who and what we were when he blessed us. When God saved you, when God blessed you, brought you into his family, he knew exactly what you were. He knew exactly who you were. That's important for us to grasp. God saved you. God blesses you knowingly. You're not gonna, you don't sneak anything by him. I've had people come in. I've worked with people who you know, lie on a resume or, or you know, get a job dishonestly. You find out they don't really know what they're doing. Or, or people, I've had, as a pastor, I've had people come in. And we had one kid in our youth group. This kid came in, and he had these wild stories about being shot and survive, just all kinds of crazy stuff. And I finally met his mom. And uh, she's like, yeah, none of that happened. It was all completely, I didn't have any idea who this kid was. That's not the way it works with God. God knows, knows you deeply. He knows you intimately. He knows exactly what you were when he saved you. And this is why I can't accept the doctrine of losing salvation. Uh, sometimes you'll, you'll, you'll have people talk about, you know, lose, you can lose your salvation, right? This, this idea. But I can't get behind that because that implies that I could do something that would make God unsave me. That God has saved me, but I could do something so terrible and perverse that God would go, whoa, whoa, whoa. I didn't know that. 
what in the world? It's like, it's like the, the company that realizes that the resume they just hired, you know, you hired you and they find out your resume is fake. Well, I didn't know that. No, you got to go. As if I could surprise God with my depravity. God knows what I am. Did God think he was getting a great deal with me? No, he did not. God, God did not think he was getting a great deal when he saved me. How do we know that? Well, because God inspired Jeremiah 17, 9. It says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked or desperately sick. And that word sick means incurable. Who can understand it? God knows your heart is deceitful. It, he knows your heart is deceptively or desperately sick. He knows your heart is incurable. And the idea of who can understand it means God understands you better than you do. You don't even understand how depraved you are. Yet God does. And what it says, what, what Ephesians says is before creation itself, God planned for salvation. God planned for your salvation. The takeaway is not, well, God knows I'm terrible, so I can keep being terrible. And that's one of those arguments of, of, well, if you can't lose your salvation, that means that if you get saved, then you can continue to wallow in your sin. You can keep, I could, I could, I could get saved, I could go kill people, and I would stay saved. Well, the takeaway is not, God knew you were terrible, so you can, it's okay to stay terrible. That's not what God teaches. The takeaway is that God knows you better and deeper than even you know yourself, yet he offers blessing. He offers salvation. He offers restoration. The takeaway is that you are not beyond saving and you're not disqualified from serving. So finally, God blesses generously. He blesses knowingly and he blesses purposefully. That verse 4 continues on, that we should be holy and blameless before him. So even though God knows the depths of our sinful hearts and saves us anyway, he doesn't save us to leave us to wallow in the filth of our sin. He doesn't save you so you can continue to be wicked. He saves us, he blesses us to make us holy and blameless. That term holy is positional. In Christ, you are a holy one. If you put your faith in Christ, he recognized you as a holy one, as a saint. Not as, not as the Catholic Church teaches, you know, this, this almost superhero demigod who performs miracles, you know, the, the idea of saints that you can pray to. That's not, that's not what's described in scriptures. A saint is a believer, a person who's been, who's been saved by Christ. You've been made holy. That's positional. You've been washed You've been set apart for his purpose. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 6. In 1 Corinthians 6, Paul gives a, li a, a list of sins, just a list of wickedness. And he says this to the, the Corinthians. He says, and such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of our God. You were that. You were those things, but you've been washed. You've been made You've been made pure. You've been made holy. Now that term blameless is behavioral. God calls us and empowers us to live like redeemed followers of Christ. We're not, we're not called to live like the heathens, to live like the pagans. We're called to live and empowered to live righteously. Paul says this in Colossians 3. It says, if... If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things on the earth. Verse 5 of that passage, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. Put that to death. And then down in verse 12 of the passage, put on then as God's chosen ones, Holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. So God saves us. He blesses us so that we will be holy, positionally holy, and behaviorally blameless. Live righteously. God has no intention of leaving you as you were. We often invite people in and say, you know, come as you are, 
but don't leave as you were. Too many churches in America. You wonder, you wonder why with so many churches in America, the culture is falling apart. Well, a lot of churches in America say, hey, come as you are and leave as you were. God doesn't want to change you. There, there are some churches that say that. God loves you just the way you are. Just wants you to, God's happy with you just the way you are. No, no, he's not. He is not. God has no intention of leaving you as you were. God's desire is to change you into what you should be. The challenge, will you strive to obey him? Will you grow into a mature godly man or woman? A mature godly person who enjoys peace with God and works to glorify him in his life. That's the challenge. As we close out, I want to give you a moment to respond to God's word. I'm ask Karen to come to the piano. If you're here and you're a believer, you've, you've known Christ. Maybe you just got saved recently. Maybe you've been a Christian for decades. Maybe like Paul, you've been saved for 30, 40 years. God has blessed you. He's given you this salvation. He's given you every spiritual blessing. Are you living in light of that blessing? Are you living like a child of God? Are you living like Paul did, seeing the bigger picture, more than just this world? Are you striving to be holy and blameless? If not, I would challenge you, repent of that to God. Pray, talk to God, ask him for strength, for wisdom. But change your focus. Maybe you're here and you don't know Christ. I'll tell you, God is offering you every spiritual blessing right now. Would you put your faith in Christ today? Would you, would you recognize your sin, recognize your inability to save yourself, and call on Jesus for forgiveness? You can do that today. There's, there's no magic prayer. There's no, there's no special words. It's simply recognizing I'm a sinner, and I need Jesus to save me, asking Christ to save. Uh, our prayer team is standing by to pray with you. I'm going to pray, and then we'll play the closing song. Lord, we come before you. We thank you that... We can start, we can begin the process of unpacking this passage. I pray that you would challenge each one of us, Lord, for those who know you as Savior. Let us see you, perhaps with, with new eyes today, recognizing that your gifts are incredible. They're generous. They're knowing. And they're, they're purposeful. You've saved us to change us into what we should be. I pray that you would be with those who know you as Savior. Grow us, challenge us, strengthen us, Lord. And I pray that you'd be with those who don't know you yet. I pray that you would let them see their need for salvation, recognize that, that you offer the only way of hope. And I pray that you'd bring them into faith. Let them feel the, the forgiveness and the adoption that you offer. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.